Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 George and Lisa are overseas students studying in Britain. They are returning home for the summer holidays. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. That'll be $23. Right, there's your change. Have a nice trip. Oh, I'll just get your bags out of the boot. Thank you very much. Now, George, let's find the check-in desk. Yes, but with all the changes they have made here at the airport, I'm not sure where the check-in desk is. I know, it's strange, isn't it? Why don't we ask for help? Good idea. What about that man sitting down over there? Which one? The one with the hat on and in the trolley? No, the one with the uniform behind the table. I'll ask him. Excuse me, could you tell me where the check-in desk for France Air is, please? Oh, um, let me think. The best way to get there would be to turn left at the end there, where the cafe is, and then go straight ahead until you're opposite the departure gate's entrance. Oh, no, 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 S sorry. Um, it might be quicker to turn right as soon as you get past the cafe and keep going along the corridor until you come to the sliding doors at the end. On the left. Yes, that's it. All the check-in counters are in a hall there. I'm pretty sure France Air is directly to your left as you walk in the hall. Thanks a lot. So, it's the left past the cafe and then right opposite... The bookshop. You can't miss it. Come on then, Lisa. We don't want to be late, and I want some time to get a cup of coffee and look around the bookshop. OK, George, but I want to go to the restroom first. I'll meet you at the check-in desk. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I would like to check in for flight FA492. Very good. Uh, can I have your ticket and passport, please? Oh, yes, here you are. OK, thanks. Uh, if you could just put your suitcase on the scales. Oh, I have this extra box that I want to take as well. OK, well... That's extra luggage, so I'll have to get you to fill out an excess baggage declaration certificate. It'll cost extra, I'm afraid. Let me see. Um, $40 exactly, if the total value of your contents is under $400. Oh, well, what's the form for? It's just a form you have to fill out so that if there are any problems, we'll know where you are and how to contact you. So, if you can give me a few details, I'll key in the information. OK, then. Your passport says your name is Lavier. Is that right? Yes, George Lavier. George, uh, L-A-V-I-L-L-I-E-R-S. Good. Now, nationality. French? No, wait a minute. It's a Swiss passport. Well, yes, I live in France, but I was born in Switzerland. Swiss. Very good. Flight number... F.A. 492. Destination is... Paris. Are you connecting with any other flight in Paris, or will you be staying there? I'm spending my vacation in Paris. Well, Sèvres, just outside Paris. OK. So what's the phone number there? Um, let me think. The country code for France is uh, 33, and the number is 19861-4537. Right, so that's 331-9861-4537. Yes, that's it. And can you tell me briefly what you have in the box? 
Well, there are some books, just university textbooks from last semester. Some clothes and, uh, oh, yeah, my computer discs. Okay, thank you. And what would be the approximate value of the contents? Mm, quite a bit, actually. About, um, yes, about $150. That's all. There's your receipt for the books, your passport and ticket, and here is your boarding pass. Gate 7. You can board the plane in about 35 minutes. Have a nice flight. That is the end of part 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, and cold drinks and snacks 
can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5, just half an hour before closing time. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide nine meters in height and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium, with 16 carts, 8 for single drivers and 8 for kids preferring to ride along with mum, dad or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One-style carts, but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 metres because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the best ways to study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, how are you both settling in? Fine. 
Yes, no problems. So far, anyway. Good. Remember that as your personal tutor, I'm here to help you if you do have any difficulties. Now, as you know, lectures start on Monday, so I thought we'd look at a few ways of making the most of them, especially in terms of the notes you take. Let's begin by thinking about what you can do before you even go to the lecture. <laughs> any ideas? Um, make sure you're up to date with all the background reading, so you know plenty about the subject already. Yes, that's essential. The lecturer will assume you have that knowledge. Anything else, Carlos? Well, uh, check what the topic's going to be. Of the lecture, that is. I'd go a bit further than that and consider what the content may be. Then you could ask yourself some questions that you want answering and listen out for the relevant information during the lecture. OK. Now that brings us to the lecture itself and the actual business of writing notes. But there is a lot to deal with there, so we'll come back to that later. What I'd like to do for the moment is continue with the process of note-taking and move on to the next stage. Any suggestions for what that might be? When the lecture is over, you mean? Yes, once you're able to sit down somewhere quiet with your notes. Uh, read them? More than that, you need to make sure they'll still make sense to you weeks, months later. Edit them? Yes, that's what's needed. Mm. It's well worth spending a few minutes on it. Any missing words, anything difficult to read, things you didn't have time to jot down, now is the time to do so, while everything's still fresh in your mind. Right. And after that, when's the best time to revise them? When do you think, Carlos? Um, I'd say just before the next lecture, in the same subject. Precisely. <laughs> That's a vital time to look at them again, for obvious reasons. But it's definitely not the only time. When should you revise them again? A month later, maybe? Uh, sooner, and much more often than that. I'd recommend you look at them again once a week. That's why it's so important they're complete and easy to follow. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. Let's go back to note-taking and begin with the basics before the lecture has even started. What should you do when you walk into the room? Get a good seat, at the front if you can, uh, where you can hear clearly and avoid distractions. Yes, though obviously others will have had the same idea, so it's as well to get there a bit early. So, when the lecture's underway and you're busy jotting things down, what should you try to ensure? That you're getting all the main points. And what if you don't catch something, something you know must be important? Uh, I'd leave a space, then I could check it later. Perhaps by asking a question at the end and fill it in afterwards. That's an excellent way to deal with it, yes. Mm. And there's something else I'd like to mention here. Talking about going through notes afterwards, it's absolutely vital that what you write is legible for one very good reason. It saves time. You'll waste many hours during the course if your revision is held up because you can't read what you've written. OK. What else can we do to make listening and note-taking more efficient? Well, I always listen out for signpost words. Uh, sorry, what are they? <laughs> they're the ones lecturers use to say where they're going. A bit like a signpost at a road junction, I suppose. Things like, the first reason is, however, to sum up, and so on. Yes, they can tell you when something important is coming and help you organize your notes, too. Is there anything else you can add, Carlos? Uh, there's something I think's very useful. 
but it's later, after the lecture is finished. Yeah, that's fine. Go on. Well, what I do is go through what I've written down, summing up the main points in a few words in the margin, on the left-hand side of the page. I try to use words that'll jog my memory, so that I can remember what everything's about when I look at them again. Yes, that can work very well. What some people do to review their notes is cover up their full notes from the lecture, maybe with a piece of paper or a card, and concentrate just on what they've put in the margin, trying to recall the details. Then they move the cover down a little and check whether they were right. Or you could put your main points on another piece of paper and clip them together. Instead of covering and uncovering, you just hold a page in each hand. Sure. It's down to personal preference, really. Everyone has their own learning style. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a place called Kuba Pedi. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Good afternoon. Today, we're continuing this series of talks on the development of the Australian outback with a look at Cooba Pedy, the desert town of opal mines and underground living, which lies 860 kilometres north of Adelaide and 690 south of Alice Springs. The inaccessibility harsh climate and almost total lack of water made it a highly unlikely place for human habitation. But that all started to change in 1915 with the discovery there of opals, the precious stones which seemed to change colour according to their surroundings. Settlements were established following the First World War when soldiers returning from the trenches of France brought with them the techniques of living below ground in dugouts. The depression of the 1920s and 30s led to many prospectors leaving, but the town boomed again in the late 1940s when shallow new opal fields were discovered and immigrants from Europe arrived in large numbers after the Second World War. It must be remembered, though, just how hostile conditions were. Daytime summer temperatures reached well over 50 degrees centigrade, winter nights were bitterly cold, and dense dust storms regularly blanketed the town. To cope with this, more and more people began living in disused mines and purpose-built subterranean houses, where the temperature remains at a comfortable 25 degrees all year round, so that eventually, Around 70% of the town's inhabitants had made their homes beneath the surface. This led to the construction of hotels and even churches below ground, as well as an entire underground shopping centre, the only one in the world.
Now answer questions 37 to 40. Perhaps not surprisingly, this has now led to the emergence of a secondary industry, tourism. Increasing numbers of visitors come to see the tunnels and the caves with their ventilation shafts, the weird machines lying about in the town, and, just beyond it in the scorched red desert, the conical hills thrown up by the world's biggest opal mines. It's a logical stopping place for travellers too. The nearest town to Cooperpedi is Woomera, in the prohibited area once used for launching space rockets. But even that is an enormous distance away. Within the town itself, there are plenty of hotel rooms and a number of ethnic restaurants. Remember that Cooperpedi is one of the most multicultural places in Australia, with an estimated 45 nationalities represented and its very own Opal Museum. A short distance from town, there's a section of the enormous barrier that runs thousands of kilometres across the country. The Dingo Fence, which is meant to keep these predatory wild dogs out of the sheep farming areas. Another attraction just outside town are the sets of various films made there, including Mad Max 3, as well as The Red Planet, and Until the End of the World, names that reflect the harshness of the terrain and temperatures there. The name Kuba Pedi, incidentally, comes from an Aboriginal expression meaning white man's hole in the ground. Next, I'd like to go on to talk about Broken Hill, another mining town, but one that... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.